You know, I don't know. We just did this, uh, you know, like last week or kind of, kind of a last minute gig. So I don't really have an investment in who knows and shows up and it's LA anyways. This is the town where I went to Largo at the Coronet to see Steve Martin play live. It's a 200 seater and there were 80 people there. That's sad. It's, that's it's, it's ridiculous because he's selling out a 3,000 seat hall every other city, um, but that's LA. So you kind of, you know, you, you kind of can't be attached to that. In LA what you really look for is a nice venue with a great sound and eventually over time you'll do it again and again and again and people will catch on. You know, it's everything you do in LA is an investment. That's a tough one because, you know, the different gigs have sort of different, but insofar as stand-up, your best space is about for real laughter and all that kind of stuff. It's about 500 to 800 seats um, and a wide enough breadth where there's no bad seats. You don't want to necessarily be in a big straight line. Band-wise, I've done everything from uh, play guitar on stage at the Royal Albert Hall uh, to you know do a band gig at a um, at the Beverly Hills High School uh, back in the mid '90s or whatever. On you know, I think the best gigs are ultimately about sound. You can play the most awesome place and go, oh, fuck, we're finally at this place. This is the gig, and it. And the sound end up, ends up sucking and you're working way too hard and the audience doesn't get to hear the best version of you. And then you play a place that's kind of, you know, sort of emotionally a toss-off. You're like, that oh, might be a nice place. We'll do a gig there. And you walk out feeling like that was the greatest show of your life because you could hear yourself and they, you could be heard.
say that because LA, insofar as what it costs to live here, is a pittance compared to New York, for example. You do a show in New York, though, the places are packed and people pay to get in. They just assume that that's the gig, you know? And the, and the prices are so much higher. Oh, yeah. Because I guess everybody knows everybody's making a living, so they're okay with it. Whereas in LA, you know, everybody's tr it's trying to leapfrog over everybody else. So you never want to give an advantage to anybody else. So you don't want to pay for a show. So you don't want to give anybody else kudos. You don't, you know, everybody's afraid to do that. And luckily in metal, it's a safer zone. We're a metal band, so we, you know, it's a lot more camaraderie in the rock world than there is in the you know, pop singer songwriter crowd. Those guys will eat each other alive. It's you think metal bands would be in fist fights and in parking lots outside the Roxy or the Whiskey. That's not the case at all. You know, everybody's like, look at heavy riffs, dude. But you're walking out. But it a showcase for singer songwriters where everybody's got an acoustic, you'd be surprised somebody doesn't get knifed in the parking lot because it's so cutthroat.
think I think part of it's like tempo and distortion are, are your big factors, but also the attitude of the songs themselves. I mean, you can you can do heavy songs that aren't metal. I mean, grunge ultimately is is metal without the uh, minus the Valkyries and sets. You know, is it? You know, you take away the Iron Maiden elements, no history lessons, no anything. You know, grunge is just about yourself ultimately, and maybe too much so at times. And metal can be, you know, anything from Dio, you know, to, you know, Dream Theater or something like that. You know, I don't, I don't mind uh, playing diverse shows. You know, ultimately, you know, if you play a festival, it's just as confusing. I mean, I've done stand-up on the same stage I've done metal, and if there's anything odder than opening for yourself, that, you know... I don't know what it is, so the acoustic act in the beginning, totally cool, set a tone, small crowd in the beginning, and then people are, you know, there's a rock band on now that's kind of straight ahead rock, and then we'll heavy it up a bit. It's almost like there's an arc, so I'm fine with that. There comes a point in every band's life where they have to write a slow song, so we wrote one, and it's called The Slow Song.
child will not affect my art or my uh, choices in my art at all. Because I, because I decided who I was before I had a kid. Yeah, I mean, you know, and the, they they have a saying in the in the uh, in the South, children make adults, and in the North, adults make children. And uh, and it really has to do with the fact that in the South, you're not mature when you have your children, and the act of raising them is the thing that forces you into adulthood. And in the North, there's a tendency to go, I gotta get my shit together before I expose a child to my self-questioning, you know, lack of knowledge of myself. And I come from that school. I got, I mean. Get your shit together. Know who you are. Don't take it out on a kid. Go, I don't know who I am, kid. You know, your old man's got as many questions as you do. No fucking way. So, I, I feel good about where I am. I don't... I have no illusions I won't discover things. But I discover things all the time. That's that's the that's growth in life. And in the back of my mind, I've always thought of raising my son in, in you know, or my children that I end up having, because I will have multiple over time, in Chicago, just because I feel better about that as a space for it. But I don't have anything against L.A. that I couldn't raise them here perfectly fine. Because there are... You know, there's the Osborne kids and there's Nick Simmons. You know, there's, uh, you know, there's the, the Hiltons. Um, and then there's, I guess, the children of stars you never hear about because they're perfectly fine. I played bluegrass with my dad when I was a little kid. Um, but I'll let him find that on his own. I mean... Are you going to encourage that? Are you going to encourage uh, He'll have... Oh, this will be a borderline Asian household. He's going to be forced into piano lessons cruelly and vehemently at a very early age. And then guitar. Uh, but insofar as if he wants to use it later, that's up to him. But, I, you know... I, I think your whole... I think kids come in with their own personality and their soul and their plan and their destiny. And your only, only job... As, an, as the adult in their life is to show them how to not be poisoned and die and get run over by a car or hang out with the wrong people. You, you're, that's your only job. Is like, look, that plant is poisonous. Don't eat it. That one's okay. And the rest of it has got to be up to them. Oh.
straight edge. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I never have. I never will. Uh, I feel like in many ways in L.A. and even in New York or the rest of the country at this point, for the matter, for the fact of the matter, I I feel a bit like the the white rat in the experiment that's getting the placebo, you know, because you know, you know, when I was in school and everybody would go the. Peer pressure was always about, well, you drink, everybody does it. That's the biggest reason not to that I can think of. I don't do a lot of things that people do automatically, like alcohol and church. Those should be profound decisions, because if you're permanently affecting your biochemistry and there's no going back. There's, you know, and, and I am me. I am baseline. I am Hal Sparks. I am not me minus pot. I'm not me minus coke. I'm not me minus alcohol. I'm me. Once you take those things, you are you plus that thing. You plus coke. You plus pot. You plus, and you'll never know what just you is again. Because you've used it. It's a shunt. It's a lift. And it's and I'm not faulting it. You can do it if you want to. And maybe you plus that is a great thing. And it ends up being great for your life. But it's not a deficit in mind. There's a lot, you know, the song Mad Season, which we open up with, is sung from the point of view of a rock star who dies of a heroin overdose, essentially. You know, and his only justification is, I want to feel it. And um, there's a line in it which is, you know, legends lead me to see the well-beaten way, meaning that the people, the opposite of what is true, people should encourage you to take the alternate route, to go find yourself, the most extraordinary human beings who would, in all practical sense, say, don't listen to the crowd, do what you would do, you know, or in Alistair Crowley's or do what thou wilt. That being said, most of the time people just follow right in that thing, you know, uh, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Lane Staley, all these people who died of heroin overdoses, and they'll go, I want to be like them, so they start shooting up. It's a well-beaten path. If you want to be like them, they were the outsider when they did it. So find another way to be an outsider. The ironic part I discovered when I was a kid was the way to rebel against my father was to not drink. You can't rebel against your parents by doing what they did. You can't rebel against your parents' generation by usurping what they've done and assuming that's the way. Uh, since this is our shits and giggles uh, game before we play uh, House of Blues on the 4th of July, uh, Sort of appropriate to the season. Um, and I'm sure you guys all know this one, so if you do, just sing along, you know. Uh, anybody know uh, the album Alive 2? Anybody know this Alive 2? Nothing? All right. Uh, three people? Great. Thank you, three people. The, uh, it had a live side, um, as we recall. And uh, this is one of the songs that was on there. It's called All American Man. Thank <laughs> you. 